And now the man who created that wonderful Kildare chorus and uh, the gentleman who is the possessor of one of the most illustrious records in all of golf is with us today. Arnold Palmer, welcome to Golfing America. Thank you, Joe. I want to uh, assure our viewers right at the outset that you are going to pass on some uh, invaluable tips and advice pertaining to how they can improve their game. But i got to ask you, how in the world did you ever get involved in building golf courses? Well, uh, of course, being raised in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and at the uh, Latrobe Country Club, where my father was the golf course superintendent and the pro mm -hmm. for 55 years, 55 years. Uh, I was uh, raised in the environment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and over the years, from the time he became the superintendent until uh, I bought the club, mm -hmm. uh, there was constant change, and I was involved in that change, mm -hmm. uh, working for him on the grounds as a young boy, and then coming back after I was on the tour, and we built, uh, well, we started by building two par fives, and then we uh, went on and built uh, nine holes to make it a, a full 18 hole golf course and and we really uh, I worked with him and, and architected that uh, nine holes and uh, that kind of lit a fire in me and uh, as the years went on I got more and more involved I started out doing uh, some local golf courses and uh, then got going internationally and uh, just kept going well and you enjoy it obviously well, I enjoy creating, mm -hmm. and uh, and it, it you know, building a golf course is is a is a lot of fun, but it isn't always as easy as people think it is, and and there are negatives to mm -hmm. doing this, uh, uh, and there have been times when people wanted me to build golf courses for them that I told them that I they shouldn't build golf courses. Is that right? Uh, we had a case in the West Coast where uh, a man wanted to give a golf course. Uh, to a uh, university, mm -hmm. and uh, the land was really not suited, and we advised them not to do it, and, uh, and it never happened, as a matter of fact. Oh, now, let's uh, take this from square one. Once you get a contract, pros, uh, say at Kildare, mm -hmm. what is the sequence of events that gets that golf course going and finished? Well, uh, of course, uh, Kildare <coughs> Was a was an exception. It was a it was a great piece of property. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a it was a uh, stable, a horse farm, mm -hmm. and uh, and I suppose there were some drawbacks. But the the most important thing was that it was a very usable piece of property. Uh, we moved a lot of dirt there. Yeah. Uh, we built some lakes. Mm -hmm. uh, we did some things that uh, we had to do to make it a championship golf course, and and that was move of quite a lot of dirt. Uh, may I interject here? I think you're a little too modest. You moved a million tons of dirt. As well, a million I'm yards. Well, okay. From uh, what uh, that book says, it says tons, but it was a lot of dirt on it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> in golf course uh, uh, vernacular, they oh, okay. call right. it, uh, a I lot think, a million yards of dirt. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it is a great golf course, oh, yeah. and only uh, over the years will get greater. Mm -hmm. And of course, Michael Smurfett uh, did a fantastic job of uh, of appointing the land, the golf course, the hotel. Mm -hmm. I don't know uh, the hotel is just uh, outstanding, and the service and the whole thing is is uh, one of the high points of, of Irish golf, I think, oh, and uh, one that will uh, continue to be uh, acknowledged as that as the years go on. Well, they're fully intending for it to be a championship course. The Irish uh, uh, championship is going to be held there. He's, they've already applied for Ryder Cup uh, things. So they really think you have done uh, a marvelous job. Just to complete the, some of the startling statistics com that you accomplished at uh, Kildare, I understand that there were 14 man-made lakes. There were the planting of 8,000 uh, new trees. And uh, plus, you put an irrigation system from tea to green. Well, yes, it has a fully automatic irrigation okay. system, and and as I said, there are things still happening. Oh, Some sure. drainage things are happening mm -hmm. from right now, yeah. and uh, and that will only improve the golf course, mm -hmm. uh, so that it's a it's very playable year round. Uh, Speaking and, and of that, uh, playable. This is a championship course, but you have actually designed maybe four courses in one because of your tee boxes, haven't you? Well, we have made it so that hotel guests right. 
can go out and have a very pleasurable day. Right. But if the Ryder Cup or if the Irish Open uh, is played at uh, the K Club, and I don't know how much they push the name K Club versus <laughs> Kildare. <laughs> they do push uh, the K Michael Club. Michael likes the K Club. He likes that. Yes, yes he uh, does. Uh, and that, all of those things are going to lend themselves to a great golf course. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the fact that, uh, that there are numerous tees, yes. uh, and those tees will be the hotel guest can play a golf course that is relatively easy. Mm -hmm. And with the proper pin placements, uh, you can get around that golf course in, in a reasonable good score. But if, if the Ryder Cup or the Irish Open is there, you can very quickly turn it into a monster <laughs> and, uh, and turn it into a very difficult test of golf. Ernie Jones, the head pro there, told me that uh, his measure of a good golf course is how many clubs it takes in your bag to play it. And he says at the K Club, you need every club you can get. No question about it. And uh, whether it be the uh, par five, the double dog leg yes, that you uh, had the opportunity to, uh, to play, or whether it be the par five seventh, uh, which I think is also, those two holes are uh, exceptional. Absolutely, they are. Incredible. And the uh, seventh uh, being a hole that, uh, under the right conditions, you could have a go at it in two. Mm, sure. But you better be pretty accurate because uh, the, the canal and the stream running in front of that green can uh, get you in trouble pretty fast. Let's talk about accuracy just a little bit. Uh, most of the amateur golfers that I come in contact with, including myself, have this business of knowing that direction is the name of the game, and yet we spray the ball quite a bit. Why is that, and how can you correct uh, that business? <laughs> Well, you know, golf is a funny thing and a funny game. And uh, one of the things that attract a lot of people to playing the game is hitting the golf ball hard. And they don't care where it goes. Yeah. And at least initially, they just, the one thing they want to do is knock the dirt right out of that golf ball. Well, in doing that, mm -hmm. of course, they, they lose the uh, timing and coordination that is necessary to keep the ball straight. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose a combination of two things. Uh, one is is hitting it hard. I wrote a book once, uh, hit it hard. Yeah. Because I have I was known as someone that really did hit the golf ball hard and still do. Mm -hmm. But and and maintaining accuracy at the same time. And of course, that's something else. But uh, I found that uh, the one thing that in modern golf, particularly, you have to do is you have to move the ball out there. You have to get that distance. And, and, and uh, swinging within yourself, keeping mm -hmm. with the whatever. And, and they talk about uh, what is the proper golf swing. Uh, well, if you look at Sam Snead over the years, you say, well, here's a man that absolutely just had a, a, the most beautiful golf swing in the world, and it was very effective. Or you could look at Gene Littler, another mm -hmm. one. Uh, they call him Gene the Machine, the machine sure. because he hit the ball so accurately. Uh, and he swung within himself. But now you're seeing a guy like John Daly, right. who uh, any resemblance to a picture golf swing mm -hmm. is not there. No. And, uh, but he is attracting a lot of attention. And he and, does move the ball. And he moves the golf ball, which is, is the ambition of almost every golfer in the world. Mm -hmm. There were few people, there are few Paul Runyons in the mm -hmm. world today. <laughs> and uh, of course, Paul is just a super guy and yeah. a guy that learned to control the golf ball. Yeah. And he controlled it from the time he hit it off the tee until he put it in the hole. And he was pretty good at putting it in the hole. Sure when, he was. when you think about 1939, I think it was, that uh, Paul Runyon played uh, Sam Snead in the finals of the PGA Championship. And I don't think there was a person in the gallery or in the world that day that thought Paul Runyon would beat Sam Snead, but he did, yeah. and he beat him just through consistent accuracy and good putting. But that takes such discipline, though, doesn't it? It does. Absolutely. And, but golf's a disciplined yeah. game. I mean, it's... Uh, okay, listen, we're going to talk about memorable moments. You must, as a point of personal interest, take us back to 1960, uh, final round of the Masters, because I think it might have been very much at that time, and perhaps a few months later at the U.S. Open, that Arnie's army might very well have been uh, created. Uh, you remember the final round of the Masters, Ken Venturi in the clubhouse. You were on the 16th uh, tee, needing three birdies to win. What happened? Uh, I remember it very well. Uh, tell uh, me about uh, it. Uh, and of course, uh, 
I was playing pretty well. I was a fire, uh, had a lot of steam going, and uh, and made those putts. The, the the ball got it on the green, and a couple times there was a good putt, and uh, it went in the hole. Arnie, that is so self-effacing. It it is <laughs> unbelievable. When you say making three birdies under that pressure, find a round of the Masters, what was going through your head? Did you actually think you could do it? Oh, absolutely. You really did? Oh, I, I, uh, I was afraid I wouldn't do it. Really? The, that's how uh, yeah, I kind of got the feeling that I was, a lot of the time, that, uh, that I just had to make it. And it just, I couldn't stand myself if I didn't. More than, I, I, I was, I, like everyone, I suppose there was some cockiness in it, but, but more just that uh, the embarrassment, really, of not winning at that point uh, was something that worried me to death. Well, May, you did you did make the three birdies, you did win the sixty Masters, and in the, a couple of months after that, you did something else that is unforgettable: the uh, final round of the U.S. Open at Cherry Hill. Uh, Mike Suchak at the uh, start of that day was, uh, what, seven strokes uh, uh, ahead of you? Uh, mm -hmm. You were in 15th place or something like that? That's right. Tell me what the, uh, the story was, because I've heard so many uh, stories about how you decided what you needed to shoot in that final round to win. Well, in difference to the Masters a few months earlier uh, at uh, Cherry Hills, which was a golf course that I really wasn't overly familiar with. I had had the proper practice and mm -hmm. so forth, but I was very disappointed in my play mm -hmm. uh, through the first three rounds. I, I felt like I had played really pretty good golf and just botched it. Mm -hmm. uh, I hadn't done anything. I shot 72, 71, 72, and, uh, and, and was as really as probably as upset at myself as I could be. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I remember talking to Bob Drum, uh, one of, a Pittsburgh uh, writer, and, and uh, I was having a sandwich. And, and I said, Bob, uh, I think if I can shoot 65, I can still win the Open. Uh, what do you think of 65? And he says, for you, nothing. Uh -huh. And it really angered me. I was uh, a little impetuous, and I was, it, was, it, it got to me. Uh -huh. And I never finished the sandwich. Uh, I went out and hit a few practice balls and went right to the first tee and teed off and and uh, then knocked it, that drive you, on the green. You drove the green. Right. How far was that drive? Uh, I think they measured as 336 yards. Good. And uh, and then got so excited I almost three putted, <laughs> uh, making about a two foot putt for my second putt uh, after a poor first putt. But then things really started happening, and uh, and just started and made made a number of birdies, and got to the, the I think it was the uh, fifth uh, hole, uh, where this is the hole that uh, I really should birdie, mm -hmm. par five. Yeah, and I come off of a second shot a little bit, put it in the sand trap pin high, blasted out about eight ten feet, and missed the putt, made my first par. Mm. And uh, then birdied, and then made a good putt at the sixth, and another good shot at the seventh, and and of course uh, about this time, our Bob Drum and all the press guys that were not really too high on my chances of winning yeah. showed up, <laughs> and and of course the rest of it is is kind of history. I was sure. very fortunate. I played yeah. I played a good round, shot 65, and yeah. and the 280 that we figured would win did win. Isn't that incredible? Well. There are very, very many more memorable moments in uh, that great career of yours. But you were talking about hitting the ball hard. Did you always swing the way you swing? That is, with that energy, with that strength? Has well, it always been that way? Yeah, I have started out as a, as a youngster right here at Latrobe Country Club swinging very hard. And mm -hmm. I can recall uh, the critics uh, telling my father to be sure that I got it a little more under control. And my father being a, a pretty tough guy, and then he said, uh, listen, you take care of your business and we'll take care of Arnie's golf. Don't worry uh, about it. So, uh, and that was, uh, I fell down a lot of time. I hit it swung so hard yeah. and, and lost my balance and sure. so forth. And, and he never, it never worried him too much. And, and the good news is it worked out reasonably well. 
We alluded to this earlier in the interview, but I think it uh, bears uh, repeating and we'll sum it up. We have people, Bobby Jones, you have a Sam Sneed, you have a Tom Weisskopf. Okay, those are people what would call classic swings. But then we have an Arnold Palmer. We have a Lee Trevino. We have a Chichi Rodriguez. Non-classic swing. But all of them very effective. What are the elements of a great swing? Effectiveness. Yeah, but what, <laughs> what, what, what do they all have in common to get them to the ball? That's a good question. And it's a very fair question. Uh, I developed as a as a uh, as a young man when I was practicing and playing what I tried to do was I wasn't interested in being classic or swinging the golf club in any particular manner mm -hmm. what I was interested in was getting the golf ball into the fairway and then onto the green and and when I practiced I practiced blocking to a degree and that's one of the things that a lot of the critics were very critical of, that I, my left elbow was, was coming up and I was blocking a lot of shots. But I was young enough and strong enough that I could do that. I set a pattern for doing that, and, and it worked for me. Uh, I suppose you could say, uh, if you wanted to compare it, uh, when I first saw Jack Nicklaus playing golf, mm -hmm. his right elbow Flying, was right flying. Out. sure. And everybody said, "Boy, he'll never make it as long as that." <laughs> Boy, he sure didn't, did he? Yeah, he's, <laughs> I think he's going to fade here just any yeah, day so now. Yeah, well, now. He may yeah. the next ten or fifteen years, <laughs> but, but that's the, that's the whole thing. Uh, Trevino uh, will will take hours and hours explaining to you what he's doing with the golf ball. Well, there's a couple of things you have to keep you have to think about when you're when you're talking about golfers like Trevino or Nicholas or Rodriguez or any of the people you mentioned, and that is that they have learned to put the golf club in a pattern, okay. and that pattern is something that they've designed for their strength, their body, uh, their ability, mm -hmm. and and that's why they're great players and. Uh, that doesn't take anything away from the man that can do the classic swing like Sam Snead. He did the same thing, only he was fortunate enough to have a very down, basic swing. Uh, Littler the same way. But uh, my goodness, how could you ever knock a, a golf swing like Trevino, who mm -hmm. is not certainly orthodox, nope. uh, but he gets the golf ball to where he wants it to be. And the club follows the pattern that he wants it every time he takes it back. So there's a whole combination of things in that. His grip, the stance, the body turn, the position of his head, which is always in a very sound position. And the strength, and, and that doesn't mean physical strength. It means more the strength that he uses in, in the coordination and the movement of that club through the golf ball. Look at Chi Chi. Uh, Chi Chi's hands are as he says, uh, his, uh, his largest thumb or finger is about like my small finger. Right. But look at him hit the golf ball. Distance, oh, yeah. uh, accuracy, uh, and, 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 and you say, Chi Chi, his hands are not strong. Mm -hmm. But don't underestimate, again, any of these people. They, are, they have strong parts to their body, sure. whether it be their shoulders, their arms, mm -hmm. their uh, legs, yeah. those things are there, and you just can't ignore them. Yeah. Uh, that's, and that's all part of the golf swing. Well, Jack has small hands, but he's got big, strong legs. Exactly. And, and he uses his legs, and he has used his legs very, very well through the years. And uh, now, again, it, it's, it's what you can make out of what you have to work with. So if we were going to sort of have a Ten Commandments of golf, probably one of the first commandments would be know thy swing and try to get it to repeat, whether it is in the classic mold or even in the mold of accepted um, uh, behavior in the uh, golf parlance today. Well, right. Uh, I've it. always said, if, if, you, if, if you let me put your hands on a golf club yeah. and put them on there properly, right. then you go ahead and swing the golf club, and as long as you keep your hands on there, in that orthodox mm -hmm. and, and uh, let's say, conventional mm -hmm. uh, tradition, if you wish, manner. Yeah. Uh, and you keep practicing with them on there, I'm going to make you a pretty good golfer. 
Tell me what is the best golf grip or the grip that you would recommend to uh, anybody. Well, I, I know <clears throat> there's three grips, and they're all pretty basic, and they're all uh, proper. Mm -hmm. And whether it be the Varden or overlapping grip, which mm -hmm. I use, yeah. or whether it be the uh, interlocking grip, which Nicholas uses, or whether it be the full finger grip, which yeah. a guy like Art Wall or Bob Rosberg <clears throat> used very successfully through their years. And there are players today doing mm -hmm. the same thing. But the fact is that uh, that these, these are the proper grips, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and the basic fundamentals are there, whether it be the Vs are mm -hmm. running parallel, one V isn't going this way, and one V is going right. the other way. And, and those are things that are going to help you and make you a good player. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about uh, putting. You were one of the most audacious and confident putters I've ever seen. Did you actually think you're going to make those 25, 30 footers? Or were oh, you just trying to get them close? Absolutely. You really saw it go in? Oh, I, uh, I always felt like uh, if I could get the ball and, and all I needed to do was get it going into the hole, it had every chance to go in. It was not going to be short. You, that's and, what I was just going to say. You were almost never short. And that was one of the things that I, I learned early, just to get the ball to the hole. Whatever happened, keep it going. And, and you know, a lot of the time you get tentative, and that's what <coughs> ruins the putting. That's what where the putting goes. Mm -hmm. we, we start getting tentative with the putter. We're scared we're going to put it too far by the hole and, and then miss it coming back. And, and those are the things that cause people to putt poorly. As long as they can keep a positive attitude about getting the ball by the hole, mm -hmm. And, and not worrying about it coming back, yeah. they're going to be good putters. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, whether you, everybody has a different approach to putting, but they can't change that approach. Yeah. And that is get the ball by the <clears> hole. <throat> so it's confidence uh, to a Absolutely. certain extent in thinking Absolutely. about it. Now, the business of uh, putters, I know that you've got a whole wall in your workshop of putters, <laughs> I, and many have been given to you and uh, some you tinker with and so on. Do amateurs really ever give enough thought to choosing the correct putter for them? Or is there a correct putter for a, a particular type? Well, I think uh, one of the most important things to putting and, and good putting is, is the eye appeal mm -hmm. to the putter. Yeah. Uh, if a man looks at a putter and he, and he has a, and it is appealing mm -hmm. to his eye, yeah. uh, that's going to be sufficient for him to be a good putter. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a Calamity Jane or a, a, a 504 or a Cash In or a Bullseye, you mm -hmm. name it. Yeah. Uh, whatever <coughs> uh, it might be, if it's appealing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always feel like if the lines are pretty straight on a putter, uh, that helps too. Mm -hmm. uh, rectangular lines mm -hmm. or square. Uh, can can help. Now that doesn't mean that you have to have them because a lot of people that put it awfully good didn't have the sure. straight lines. Yeah. And the the manner of getting the ball to the hole as far as a shoulder stroke, a wrist stroke, uh, does that come from practice and see what works for you? Well, I think so, yeah. I, uh, of course, the law of averages today, if you watch the, uh, the young guys playing on the tour, uh, you will see most all of them are arms and shoulder putters. They're not wrist putters. Mm -hmm. they, and, and, and they have, they're better putters than, like, let's say, that we were back in a few years ago, simply for that reason. But it, you can't ever knock uh, someone like Billy Casper, who had a very definite wrist break. And he popped the ball. Popped the ball and putted just fantastically Absolutely. well. I broke my wrist and putted pretty well. Uh, Jack, from time to time, was a wrist putter also. Uh, so there, there is no set system. The system is the one that you know and you can use the best. You're telling me that your putting stroke changes or has changed? I have never known anyone that didn't have a change in their putting stroke. Maybe Bobby Lott. Oh, but he used to hook the, did he used to hook the, or was that Cruick Shank? No, no, that was Bobby Lott. Was Lott. that Bobby Lott? He, he was probably the greatest putter oh, of was. all time. And uh, I remember playing uh, in the British Open. Uh, oh, gee, a few years before Bobby quit playing, uh, yeah. and, and he was still the best putter I'd ever what seen. Do you, what do you think made him 
that good. Because let's face it, Arnie, the, the greens then were not anywhere what the greens were today. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's probably what got him started doing what he was doing by hooking the putt. He didn't depend on what was the, the greens were, what texture, what uh, grasses he was putting on. He was going to make the ball do the same thing on any grass that he was on and any surface. And that's what he did. He made the ball roll from right to left. And, and he learned to do it so well that it didn't matter what the surface was. Uh, he could pop it. It would bounce and jump and do all kinds of things. But it was going right at the hole every time. But he had this uncanny ability uh, to, to gauge distance and feel. He must have had an enormously uh, sensitive uh, touch to be able to decide how hard he's going to hit this ball because he was sinking them from all over. Well, I think he had a, he had a tremendous touch and he mm -hmm. had a good feel. But the other thing is to remember that from the system that he used was a system that the ball was turning over yeah. all the time and it was always turning to the left. So he, and he knew how far he could go outside to the right. He played golf that way. He, his, there were golf courses that he had trouble playing because the trees on the right were too close to the fairway. And he hooked everything. And he, he had to go through them to get into the fairway. <laughs> well, it's, it's uh, amazing. Uh, of the, the, the idea, though, as you say, is the idea is get... Okay. Are you ready? Okay. Arnie, we talked a little bit earlier about accuracy. We talked about distance. Uh, course management is something that the average golfer really doesn't pay too much attention to, and yet, you take a course like Kildare or any challenging course, it's imperative that they know what the course is all about. Do you think amateurs don't pay enough attention to course management? Well, I think, uh, I think as they get better. They do. Their handicap gets down. They, yeah. they become better managers mm -hmm. of the golf course and their game. Mm -hmm. uh, Kildare is a golf course that uh, will require course management, right. even from the good players, mm -hmm. uh, the low handicappers. But uh, I, I did a book once called Situation Golf, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that was really about managing your game mm -hmm. to the golf course you're going to play. Okay. And, and I suggested that more people should think about that. If, they're, if their primary purpose is to improve their game, lower their handicap, uh, then that's what they need to start thinking about. And that doesn't mean you can't hit the golf ball hard and yeah. go after it and do all the things you like to do, but you, you really have to think of the consequences okay. of hitting the bad shot mm -hmm. or, or pulling or pushing the shot and, and give yourself that little edge or that little extra room that you might uh, need to keep the ball in place. What are some of the uh, basic, say, suggestions for course management for the average golfer? Uh, for instance, uh, perhaps on the tee, they might be able to move themselves one way or the other. What are some of the things they can notice in the course of playing around, perhaps, that might help them? Well, uh, one of the things that I always uh, have used in, in playing a golf course, uh, let's say that you're, you're uh, gee, let's go to the first hole at Kildare, if you wish. Okay. And, and with an out of bounds on the left side. Right. And, uh, and, and you've got a pretty good sized T there. And the trouble to the right is, is trouble, but it isn't nearly as serious as going out of bounds. Sure. So I always, when in a situation like that, I go to the right side of the T. Okay. And I always felt like if, if I'm on the right side of the T and shooting down that right side, uh, when you hit a ball 200 yards or 250 yards, the, the few yards that you give yourself on the tee from the left to the right is, magnifies itself when it gets out there 200, 250 yards. That's so true. you're really giving yourself a pretty good edge mm -hmm. by moving to the right side. If you pull it, the chances are you're not going to pull it out of bounds. Uh -huh. And that kind of thing is, is the thing that I always look for, a little advantage and there's always an angle uh, such as uh, maybe uh, a, a lake or something on the right side uh, of a hole and it could be any hole that, uh, and you uh, again you can use the first 
solution to that, moving to the left and, and using the left side of the T. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes go back to the right side, the same side as the lake is on, yeah. and particularly if there's no trouble to the left, yeah. and aim it across oh. and shoot it and go across the, the line mm -hmm. to the left side. Yeah. I guess also it, it depends on what kind of a ball you're uh, hitting that particular day. If you're hitting a fade, if you're hitting a draw and so on, you've got to know your game again. And uh, I suppose you uh, ought not to try anything too uh, chancy uh, when you're confronted with the out of bounds and that kind of thing. Well, the penalty, uh, the out of bounds penalty is a pretty heavy oh, that's penalty. A, yeah. uh, or the lost ball penalty sure. where you're hitting the ball into, into the bush and you, uh, you can't find it. It's yeah. the same as knocking it out of bounds. Sure. But those little things, so uh, the, the things you've noticed uh, and mentioned, and also the fact that if you're playing adjacent fairways and you're heading down and you putt it out on the way, or say walking down a fairway, notice where the pin is on the adjacent uh, green so that perhaps you know how far to hit it when you're approaching. Exactly, uh -huh. exactly. A lot of people never think to look at what the next, the next hole may present. Mm -hmm. And that'll help a lot. Oh. Just, uh, I. I always, my caddies are always uh, up to speed. Uh, as you know, we have pin placements handed to us and so mm -hmm. forth. So, and I always like to be reminded mm -hmm. of where that uh, flag is on the green before I tee off because mm -hmm. there's always a little, maybe just a little advantage being left or right off the tee mm -hmm. and going into that flag on that next green. And when you're playing a uh, really challenging course, like you say Kildare, or maybe the one at Turnberry in Scotland, mm -hmm. which is also a formidable, have you played Turnberry? I've played it a lot. Yes. And how do you uh, how do you find it? Well, I think it's a very good golf course, uh -huh. and, and one that we've had a lot of fun playing over the years. Well, we uh, managed to get over to uh, Turnberry, and uh, managed to play that uh, I think the 12th hole, and we were able to get on the blue tees, and we were supposed to hit. 220 yards into a 30-mile gale to carry this gorge. It's on the, uh, I think it's the uh, uh, a Firth of Clyde there, the, yeah. the ocean thing there. And uh, it is a formidable kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Is Scottish golf different than Irish golf? Courses and stuff? Well, uh, uh, Scottish golf is different in, in, in itself. Uh, the links courses on the, uh, the waterways or the oceans or the seas uh, versus the inland courses mm -hmm. are different. Yeah. Uh, but most Scottish golf courses are Lynx courses. Right. Uh, however, there are a few inland courses where I wouldn't consider them Lynx courses. Mm -hmm. uh, the Irish golf courses uh, are a combination of, mm -hmm. of Lynx and, uh, and then more the regular American style golf courses. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think Kildare, you would be able to say, is, is not a, a total Lynx golf course. No, it's, no. Or, it's an inland course. It's uh, it is. Uh, it's got a lot of trees and, yeah. and so forth. And my opinion of a Lynx course is generally a golf course that does not have a lot of trees on it. Mm -hmm. or, and and that is the difference. You know, Turnberry, as I said, doesn't seem to have that many trees. But by golly, it well, is it's a, a Lynx course. Right? Yeah, sure it is. Let's talk just a, a minute. Or two about equipment and the business of how it has developed and how it has changed the game, for good or ill or what? Well, the the high tech uh, revolution that's going on now is is changing the game. It's giving players a, a distinct advantage, I think, with lighter shafts and and you can do so much with them. You can get a lighter shaft, a heavier head, and and your overall weight is not as heavy, and it gives you a little more club head speed in hitting the golf ball. But the older players uh, mm -hmm. can really take advantage of this. Trevino says he's hitting it 15 yards longer now than he was on the And I believe turn. that. Yeah. Of course, Trevino is strong. You've got it, and, and he's and he keeps himself in pretty good yeah. shape. So you you can't uh, deny him that. Yeah. The thing that I think in equipment, uh, and of course we all manufacturers, whether it be Pro Group, my company. Uh, uh, in manufacturing peerless peats and, and clubs that are, we think, are better uh, for playing the game of golf uh, versus one thing, and that's the golf ball. Ah. And uh, I think the golf ball in technology has advanced 
uh, far faster than even the equipment. Mm. And I think if there's something that we're going to have to control uh, in the years to come, mm -hmm. it is going to be the initial velocity of the golf ball. Mm. And that simply means that we're going to have to slow it down uh, to keep from outmoding our golf courses, uh, keep our golf courses that are great, whether it be the Oakmonts or the Wingfoots or the Marions or you name it. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing that I can see that can control uh, the game mm -hmm. is the ball. Yeah. What do you look for as far as golf in the next 15 years? How do you think it's going to go? What are some of the predictions you might have for it off the top of your head? Well, uh, my, the predictions are one, uh, that we're going to have to keep it in a price bracket yeah. that people can afford. The green fees are getting a little out of line? Green fees, whatever. Golf club prices, uh, and, and I'm talking inflation and taking sure. into consideration and everything. But that would be one thing that would concern me. Uh, the other things that, that are really all pluses, once a person starts playing golf, uh, the 99 out of 100 are hooked. Yeah. I mean, That's once you get sure. into the game and you understand it and you, uh, it's the mysteries of it uh, and all the things that go on on a golf course from people you meet to the challenge of a new golf course, to uh, to the personal challenge of being able to play the game and play it well. Uh, all these things are things that uh, make the game just so fascinating. There's not another game in the world that, uh, that can be uh, as great as the game of golf, uh, the individual of the game, uh, the fact that whatever happens, you've done it to yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, no one else is doing it, right. and uh, that makes it fascinating. So and my pr predictions sure. are that the game of golf is going to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it will grow as rapidly as we've seen in the last 10, 15, 20 years uh, is questionable, mm -hmm. but it will continue to grow. We'll continue to build golf courses, maybe not as fast as we have been building them, but uh, what is going to happen around the world uh, not just in America or not in Scotland or Ireland uh, or England or Australia or South Africa, but in other places. Uh, the Indias, the third world nations mm -hmm. uh, are going to start building golf courses and we're going to see more golf in other countries uh, throughout the world. Well, Arnie, in about 15 years, why don't I come back and interview you again and see how these predictions pan out. I love it. And in the meantime, continued good luck and uh, the greatest of pleasure it has been for us to have you on Golfing America. Thanks, Joe. Thanks. My putting green? Yeah, and I would like you to show us a little putter. Yeah, are you sure you guys? I can practice my putting in winter or in the summer. <laughs> well, it wouldn't have been fun at that moment. <laughs> now you know which way the, uh, the floor is breaking. Yeah. Well, it breaks, doesn't it? Sure. Oh, if you. If you uh,
here, and I'd like for you to uh, maybe just demonstrate the, uh, the grip that you were just uh, aware of. Oh, is that still going? Or is it just a, are they going back to that? Or? We think so. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have enough people that like persimmons yeah. and like the feel and the sound yeah. uh, that, uh, that it, we, we've sold uh, something in, in a period of about three to four weeks. Uh, what is the, show me the correct grip that you would have. Well, of course, for the average player, first of all, the back three fingers are the gold of the song. Right. The index finger and thumb yeah. are the human feel of the song. And, then, and the V comes right up here to the green and the right shoulder. Okay. And then when you put this on, the middle two fingers are the pressure points. Okay. The index finger and thumb certainly hold the club also. Right. But if you'll notice, the V is parallel themselves. Okay. If you put two strings up there, they would be like railroad tracks, and they would come right to that right shoulder. And that's basically the, the grip. And if that doesn't change, then chances are your swing is going to be more conditioned. When you can put your hands on the club and feel that club just like that every time, you're going to become a better club. Uh, okay. So we don't mess around with the grip once you've got it right. Exactly. <laughs> okay. okay. Or if you like scotch, we've got a one with a uh, little of J and D. But is that actually <laughs> somebody actually produce that? Is that oh no, they produce them too. They do, and, and they have all everything you can think of, uh, from a rocket here. Is there an almond palm museum yet? If we are now house. in the process of going to create that. I think right here in the park. I think you ought to. It's just uh, amazing. Yes, sir. <clears throat> How many of those uh, drivers have you used? Just about every one of them. I've hit them with a golf ball. So. Bonnie, you said I have a good time. But thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> what's the uh, first question? Uh, checking one, two, one, two. Um, say what? Okay, ready? You're looking at me. Okay, wipe yeah. your brow. Wipe my lip or my brow. Okay. Speak. Eyes. Take it from square one once you get a contract, what do you do? All right, let's take it from square one. When you get a contract, what's the sequence of events in developing that golf course? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about accuracy uh, just a little bit. Most amateurs know they spray it in a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about accuracy. Uh, most amateurs, myself included, spray the ball all over the place. How can we correct that? Okay, let's talk about memorable moments. 1960, final. Well, let's talk about memorable moments. 1960, I think, is probably when Arnie's Army was created. Tell me a little bit about uh, the final three holes of the 1960 Masters. Talking about hitting the ball hard, has it always been that way for you? We're not going to talk about Cherry Hill then, I suppose, no. the U.S. Open. Okay. Wait, you just play. Okay. Okay, so you're talking about hitting the ball hard. Okay. Uh, have you always hit the ball then? Yeah, oh, that okay. kind of thing. Yeah, Ready? Talking about hitting the ball you've had. Before. Yeah. Ready? Tell me when. Well, no, Kate is waiting. Okay, go ahead, sir. Talking about hitting the ball hard, uh, have you always swung the way you did with. Uh, uh, let's do it again. Talking about hitting the ball hard, have you always swung the way you do with such energy and such strength? Okay. We have people, Sam Snead, etc., that that's the long question. Yeah, Sam, okay, I got that. Thing. All right. We have. Say Arnie. Okay, Arnie, we have Bob Jones, we have Sam Snead. Tom Weisskopf, all people with what we would call classic swings. But we also have Sam, oh, let me try again. Can we pick it up from, yes. but we also have, oh, let's try again. Arnie. Okay. Arnie, we have Sam Sneed. Let's do it again because you distracted me. Tell me why.
You ready? Arnie, we have... All right. Arnie, we have a Bobby Jones, we have a Sam Sneed, we have a Tom Weisskopf, all people with what we call classic swings. But we also have an Arnold Palmer, a Lee Trevino, Chichi Rodriguez, people with non-classic swings, but they are all effective. What are the elements of all great swings? So if we were to give you as a Ten Commandments in golf, what would be make it repeat? Make it repeat. If we were to have the, so if we were to, so if we were to have, uh, say, the Ten Commandments of golf, one of them would be, let thy swing repeat itself. Let's talk a little bit about putting. You were one of the most audacious okay. putters. You really, could you really think you'd make those dirty things? Let's talk a little bit about putting. You were one of the most audacious and confident putters I have ever seen. Now, did you actually think you were going to make those twenty-five and thirty footers? Let's talk a little bit about putting. You were one of the most audacious and confident putters I have ever seen. Did you actually think you were going to make those 25 and 30 footers? Tell me, Arnie, what is the best grip? Tell me, Arnie, what is the best grip? So it is con what, now, with this business of putters, I know you've worked a workshop, blah, 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 you have a lot of putters back there. No, you think amateurs give, amateurs okay. don't give enough thought to the, mm -hmm. to the right pattern for them, the right yeah. putters. Now, as far as putters are concerned, I know you have a whole wall of them down in your workshop. Do you think that amateurs pay enough attention to the right putter for them? And the manner of getting the ball to the hole, is that just practice, what works for you? And the business of getting the ball to the hole, is that a business of practicing and just seeing what works for you? You're telling me that your putting stroke change mm -hmm. or changes? You mean to tell me that your putting stroke changes or has changed? Yes. Arnie, we talk about sports management. Uh, the golfer doesn't pay attention okay. to it. Do you think amateurs pay enough attention? Arnie, let's talk a little bit about course management. Do you think that amateurs pay enough attention to course management? What are some of the basic suggestions for course management for the amateur? What would you suggest as some of the basic suggestions? Whoops. What would you suggest that an amateur do as far as improving their course management? Okay. I guess it develops a form of ball hitting. I suppose you try anything so too fancy. Don't try anything too fancy. I guess it develops upon what kind of ball you're hitting. Oh, okay. I guess a lot depends on what kind of a ball you're hitting that day, whether you're hitting a fade or a draw, to know what kind of ball will get you into trouble or keep you out of it. But those little things, notice when the pin is on the next hole. But there are a lot of little things. For instance, when you're walking down the fairway, notice where the adjacent pin is on uh, the adjacent green. And when you're playing a challenge at this tournament, is Scottish golf different from Irish golf? Is Scottish golf different from Irish golf? Great. Let's talk about equipment. And how well, you don't want to get Turnberry, right? Changed. You didn't get Turnberry. Okay. I, I was hoping to yeah. get him out. Say what? Let's talk about how it's developed equipment, how it's changed the game. Has it changed the game? Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about equipment. How has it changed the game, and has it changed the game? What do you look for as far as golf in the next 15 years? Arnie, what do you look for as far as uh, golf in the next 15 years? Think you got it? That should be great. Well, he's going to sign that picture for me. Yeah. So. Yes. Oh, you want shh, room sound. Okay. Great. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I'm just. Okay. Oh, you're welcome. And with the lights? Yeah. 